Okay, um, welcome everybody. Um, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker of the uh, semester, uh, Professor uh, Pierre Lucas, uh, um, who is from our uh, material science uh, department here at the University of Arizona. And he's also the director of the uh, CNIS International Associate Laboratory for Materials and Optics. Uh, so uh, Professor Lucas is the author of more than uh, uh, 70 peer review publications, uh, six book chapters uh, in the field of infrared glass uh, and optical sensors. Uh, he's also uh, uh, the author of a book, uh, uh, Rare Earth Science Technology Production and Use. So his research has been uh, focusing on uh, the fundamentals and application of infrared uh, cancogenite glasses, uh, uh, including their structure, uh, physical properties, and the development of novel um, optical sensors and fibers. So uh, Professor Pierre Lucas is going to talk to us about uh, cancogenite glasses uh, turning their physical property uh, for application in optics. Uh, thank you for, for coming here. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and, and the kind introduction. So as, uh, as Ken just mentioned, uh, calcogenite glass is really the, the central theme of, uh, um, uh, of my research group. So we do, and that, that includes, we do everything from very fundamental as aspects such as the structural motives, uh, the way the structure relaxes, the, the interconnectivity of the networks, uh, to more practical things such as designing new glass composition, uh, producing optical elements such as uh, fibers, ATRs, uh, pressing, um, uh, compressing elements, um, all the way to designing biosensors, or completely designing biosensors. So that I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a flavor of that uh, by uh, uh, showing you how we can uh, design uh, certain glass uh, for specific applications. Okay, so that's going to be the, the outline of my talk. I'm going to give you a general overview of what calcogenides are, uh, glass are, what they're made of, and uh, what they are used for, uh, especially uh, in your case for, for optical applications. Uh, then I'm going to go over um, some compositional, uh, a specific example of compositional engineering for the purpose of, uh, of making uh, uh, glasses with very wide optical transmission. And finally, I'll show you a few examples of what we've used these for uh, in terms of uh, biosensing and chemical sensing uh, applications. Okay, so uh, calcogenite glass, as the name says, uh, are made out of calcogens. However, you have to be careful there because oxygen, technically, group six, is a calcogen. However, uh, oxide glass is your typical oxide glass, the, your, the windows, uh, the glass bottles are oxide glass, but when we talk about calcogenite glass, we actually imply uh, the other calcogen. So anything that's made out ma mainly of sulfur, selenium, or tellurium are considered calcogenite glass. Uh, polonium, you don't want to deal with that, that's radioactive. So selenium, sulfur, uh, uh, and tellurium are the main components of calcogenite glass. Uh, as you can tell, group six, they are divalent elements. That means they are missing two electrons in order to complete their outer shell, which means they are going to make two covalent bonds. And so if you combine many of these together, you end up with a chain. So sulfur, selenium will make nice long chains and entangle all, the, uh, all these chains and you get a glass. So the pure elemental sulfur and selenium are good glass formers but by themselves. They're not very useful for practical purpose, though, because uh, the TG, the, the temperature at which they become liquid, that they start to soften, is r right about room temperature, at least room temperature in Arizona, somewhere between 30 and 40 degrees uh, Celsius. So you need to uh, cross-link these chains uh, using elements that are uh, of higher coordination. So germanium, for example, needs four more electrons, so it's, it's tetravalent, and uh, arsenic needs three more electrons, uh, trivalent. So by cross-linking these chains, you can now end up with glasses that have uh, a much better thermal uh, um, physical properties uh, and very high TG of four or 500 degrees that you can use for practical purposes. So that's typically the, the, the compositions. You can mix these to design different compositions. And you can, uh, uh, 
if we decide to be a little fancier, we can add, for example, some alkali and uh, uh, generate uh, glasses that are ionic conductors. So they are actually used for uh, uh, electrolytes for batteries, for lithium batteries or sodium batteries. Uh, you can add some transition metals, such as copper and silver, to make them electronic conductors, if uh, that's of interest uh, for you. Uh, we can also add some halides and uh, to tune the structure and in turn tune the property and I actually will, will talk uh, about that. So uh, there, there are more, you can add some tin, you can add some indium, you could add some little bismuth, some phosphorus, but so th there is a big um, compositional landscape that you can play with to design the glass with the property that are, that are um, uh, desirable. But as far as optics is concerned, there are two things that derive from this, uh, uh, this type of compositions. And because we are dealing with much heavier atom than normal glass, and when I mean normal glass, I mean oxide glass, uh, they have low phonons. So big atoms tend to vibrate more slowly, and therefore coupling with light of longer wavelengths. And so low phonon energy means wider transparency, especially in the infrared regime. So that's, that's uh, of interest for a number of opt optical applications. The second thing that derives from these large atoms is that they are typically more polarizable, large atomic uh, uh, clouds, and therefore they have fairly high nonlinearities, uh, typically two or three orders of magnitude higher nonlinearities than an oxide glass, for example. Of course, as you, you guys know very well, uh, there is a number of applications that derive uh, from that uh, in optics. Okay, so if I'm looking at optical transparency, uh, as you can see here, uh, if I change, for example, my calcogen from oxygen to sulfur to selenium to tellurium, I'm going down the periodic table, I'm getting heavier and heavier, and you see clearly that my optical window is pushed further and further and further into the infrared. So I can tune with, by composition uh, engineering, I can tune the width of my optical window just because if I'm just using, you know, the, the approximative uh, um, analogy of a diatomic oscillator, uh, the heavier the mass of my oscillator, uh, the, 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 uh, greater, the, the lower the frequency and therefore the longer the wavelengths uh, for um, uh, resonance of these, uh, of, of these uh, oscillators. So, um, so we can make glasses, as you see, with pretty wide uh, optical transparency in the infrared. Why would I want to do that, or, or wh why is it interesting? Uh, a number of reasons. <coughs> The atmospheric uh, transmission is, uh, uh, the atmosphere is transparent in a number of a range of wavelengths, obviously in the visible, we see each other, but also in the infrared. And specifically here, what we call the second atmospheric window, uh, which extends from about 8 to 14 degrees, uh, is of much interest, and especially for defense and uh, uh, security and uh, things like that, because it uh, corresponds to uh, the range of uh, emission of uh, warm bodies or hot bodies. Um, so you, you see the, the black body radiation emitted by people or an engine or, or any hot body is peaking about at 10 micron. And so 10 micron is right in the middle of that second atmospheric window. And of course, you can imagine uh, the, uh, the, the application that derives from that. Uh, so if you want to uh, uh, build or, or a device like a, a thermal imaging uh, camera, a night vision camera, uh, you need a material which is transparent in that range of wavelengths to design a lens and an optical system. So <coughs> currently, or typically, this is made out of a transparent crystal, which is germanium, uh, which requires to make a very high quality single crystal to avoid scattering from grain boundaries. Uh, then cr germanium is extremely hard, so it means doing diamond turning to create a lens, and a lens like that can cost you 10 grand. Uh, so having a material that you can mold in one shot uh, and produce any optical uh, uh, device or any op optical element uh, is, is quite advantageous, and so that's one of the purpose or, or potential applications of a uh, calcogenic glass. So if I look at my possibilities of calcogenic glass for, for an application like that, uh, you can see that my second atmospheric window is about right here. So clearly, the oxide glasses are out of the picture. They are completely opaque in that range. Sulfide is uh, it's okay, but uh, only if you have a very small optical uh, path because you're going to start absorbing very quickly in that range. Uh, selenium would work fairly well. 
uh, and definitely tellurium would be uh, f uh, um, completely transparent over the whole range. Selenium here, you can see already a little bit of a, a, a tail, of absor absorption tail here. And actually, uh, if you have a very long optical pass, such as in a fiber, and you know that the absorption is, uh, uh, is um, proportional to the exponent of the, the optical pass, uh, a tail like that would be unforgiving. Uh, your, your optical fiber would actually be opaque after only matters. So uh, to design an optical fiber in that range, you, you will, uh, will have to deal with a telluride glass. You, you should be, uh, your, your choice of material would be a telluride glass. Okay. The second wide range of application for uh, these uh, materials is uh, um, vibrational spectroscopy or, or chemical and biochemical sensing. So any molecules, whether it's a small molecule like a CO2 or, or a, um, acetone, or if it's a big molecule such as a microbe or uh, any, any uh, microorganism, uh, has a unique, very unique, specific vibrational signature, and it's used, FTIR is used as an analytical method to, to, to find, uh, to uh, analyze, selectively analyze molecules. And so, uh, same idea, if you want to design uh, an optical system which collects this kind of signature, you, you need to have a material which is transparent. And so, uh, the, the whole idea about optical uh, sensing in the infrared uh, is usually associated with collecting these, these signatures, and here it's an, uh, an example of a um, selective uh, determination here of uh, two different pathogens, so uh, uh, two different bacteria. And even though the spectro spectra look somewhat similar, uh, you know, by just uh, a visual inspection, if we do a statistical uh, uh, analysis of spectral analysis, such as a PCA, we can, we can actually separate them fairly, fairly, uh, fairly well. Okay, so uh, again, the choice of glass here uh, is going to also push or, or, or be towards the tellurides because at least if you are interested in bioorganisms, so in pathogens typically, uh, bacteria, viruses, they have the, the richest part of their vibrational spectrum is in the l l uh, 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 short wave numbers here, so long wavelengths, um, the amides, the polysaccharides, the, the, the uh, amino acids, uh, uh, phospholipids, all are in this region. So if you want to uh, identify, selectively identify these molecules, you need to have a good signal to noise ratio in that region, which means you have to have high transparency, you have to collect a, a good signal. And again, this will push you towards selecting a telluride glass versus selenium or, or sulfur. And my, my uh, last example here is a little more exotic, but uh, still the, the source of, of some research. And uh, this is um, uh, space exploration, and specifically to try to find a planet that may harvest life. Uh, so there are a couple programs that, uh, that support that. Uh, ESA in Europe is uh, called the Darwin program. They are looking for exoplanets, so planets out of our, our solar system that may harvest life. Uh, the NASA is, is uh, the, past, the, the um, planet finder program. And the idea is if you have a planet that has an atmosphere which contains water, ozone, and CO2, it might harvest life. So that's the three markers of, of life. And the idea is to detect by, by uh, uh, analysis of the, uh, the light emitted by exoplanets to detect whether these three signals are there. Uh, the problem with an exoplanet is it's always orbiting around its own star, and the star emits a whole lot more light than the planet itself, so we have to um, uh, use um, filtering techniques, such as nulling interferometry, to remove the light from the, uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, the star and observe what's actually coming out of the exoplanet. So, and you have to do that at 15 micron. So uh, the, the idea here is that uh, there, in order to do nulling interferometry, we need single mode fibers, and we need single mode fibers that are transparent at 15 microns. So you essentially need a glass because you cannot make a, a single mode fiber out of a crystal. You need to draw it. And uh, therefore, again, telluride glasses here are going to be your materials of choice because uh, it's the only one that's really going to have the high transparency in that range of, uh, of, uh, of wavelengths. Okay, so uh, so that's for number of application in, in uh, 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 related to the optical window of these materials. Um, now, 
The nonlinearity also has a number of applications that has been investigated, uh, not by us, but I'm just going to mention a couple uh, uh, examples here. Uh, this is from the Kudos group. You guys, I'm sure many of you know, know about them. In Australia, Australia gov Australian government has invested a lot of money into designing these uh, uh, fully optical um, uh, uh, telecom systems where, uh, again, they use the nonlinearity of the carcogenic glass to uh, do extremely fast uh, multi multiplexing and demultiplexing. And they use these very small uh, carcogenic uh, cheap waveguides uh, to demonstrate, indeed, very high uh, 10 gigabits per second rate of, uh, of uh, data treatment. Uh, another application of, uh, high, of the nonlinearity, the high nonlinearity of these glasses, uh, which is being uh, highly uh, uh, investigated, uh, is super continuum generation. The goal here is to produce a source of light in the infrared, covering as wide a range as you, as you can, uh, with extremely high intensity. And again, the purpose here is to serve as a source for doing sensing, and typically vibrational uh, sensing. So you do that with a fiber. So there is a lot of uh, work on uh, PCF fiber. Um, uh, um, uh, photonic crystal fibers, uh, but more recently, uh, again, the, the Kudos group, so Luther Davis, uh, uh, just recently uh, announced at a conference that they were working on, a, 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 again, a, a, a cheap device, a, a channel waveguide uh, that would produce emission all the way from 2 to 12 microns with three or four orders of magnitude higher intensity than a synchrotron. So that's not published yet, but that's what they announced. Uh, they're probably working on a, a patent before publishing it, but uh, so uh, stay tuned that, that that should be coming out. And again, that's a, 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 a little uh, channel waveguide of calcogenide that they are using to do that with an, uh, an intense laser source pretty much in the middle of the range to, to uh, expand on both sides. Okay, so I hope I convinced you that the, these materials, calcogenic glass, are useful for a number of optical applications. So now how do we actually make them? Uh, the main idea here is that you do not want any oxygen and water in there. You, you, and the problem is oxygen and water is, is present in the atmosphere. So we have to do all the synthesis under vacuum uh, in control environment. And uh, so typically you have a, a, a silica tube uh, connected to a vacuum system with, a, with a traps to, to trap uh, oxygen and water and all, all uh, any other uh, contaminants. Um, then uh, we seal that tube before cooking the, the whole thing. There is a number of purification steps that I'm not going to go over, but if you want a really, really clean uh, glass, you have to purify the glass uh, in many ways uh, through uh, using traps uh, or, or um, uh, 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 chemicals to trap the contaminants, uh, distillation of the glass, uh, evaporation of higher vapor pressure contaminants. So there is many, many steps that goes in between just putting your compounds and, uh, and sealing the tube. But um, uh, I'll show you that they are, they are essential. And so uh, once your, all your compounds, when they are clean, are sealed in a, in a silica tube, we need to homogenize them very well to make sure they are, we get a, a, a homogeneous structure, a glass structure. It's disordered, but it should be homogeneous in composition. Uh, in a rocking furnace, so we rock it for like about 12 hours or overnight, typically. And then you quench the glass in water, and you carefully break the silica tube without breaking the glass inside. And then you can draw a fiber. You can uh, polish off uh, an ATR crystal. Uh, you can slice layers and mold lenses and do anything you want to do with, uh, with, uh, with that glass. So if you did not do a good job of purifying the, the, the material, that's, that's what happened. So uh, if you introduce oxygen in there, you obviously introduce light atoms, which are going to vibrate at higher frequency, and therefore generate absorption right in your optical window. So that's not good. And uh, it doesn't require very much of it, only a, a few hundred ppms, and, and you'll mess up uh, half of your window. So, so it's very important, again, to, to uh, spend some time purifying uh, the, these materials and getting rid of all the impurities. And even if you spend a lot of time uh, through the, the, the conventional techniques, uh, you, you still end up with peaks of impurity 
if, again, you're looking through a very long pass, and here I'm showing the transmission, the attenuation of, a, of a, a, what we call TAS fiber, tellurium arsenic selenium fiber, and you see that we, we still have remaining impurities. It's extremely hard to get rid of hydrogen, uh, to capture hydrogen and completely remove it from, um, from the material here. So we, we still have a little bit of peaks of impurity in there. Okay, so... Anyway, once you manage to make one of these clean uh, uh, glass, uh, you can then process them. And again, molding is one option. They are extremely good. Um, they are very moldable in, in the sense that they, they mold very well. Uh, they they, they uh, reproduce the imprint of your mold with extremely high accuracy. That means that you can, you can um, uh, for example, generate aspherical lenses, generate uh, um, diffractive lenses by, by producing patterns uh, uh, that are on the mold. And uh, therefore, producing very easily complicated optics uh, just by molding. And they are currently molded uh, literally by the million uh, to produce these little cameras that they put in the, the, um, uh, the bumpers of cars. So it's typically high-end cars, Cadillacs or BMWs. But now you have little a night vision ad in your, in your car. If there is a deer crossing a mile away, you, it close, you see it very clearly if people are crossing the road at night or in the fog, you can see them. So, so that's one of the big applications, at least in terms of production, uh, mass production uh, for, for these little lenses. And they are extremely cheap to make. They, they cost a couple of dollars. They are small also. Okay, so another fabrication approach is uh, fibering or, or processing that you, you might be interested in. Uh, so the classic uh, uh, way of, of just uh, melting the tip of a preform and then rolling it and uh, producing uh, um, a fiber. So you can coat them, you can make uh, core clads, you can uh, make PCF by making several tubes together. So all of these, uh, the, the, the same process as an optical fiber, uh, an oxide fiber uh, works pretty much with uh, calcogenite. Okay, so while we're talking about fibers, uh, I want to uh, go back to my optical transmission here and say a few words uh, about that. Is uh, again, it, it's the vibrations that are that is responsible for the cutoff in the IR and. And we can actually measure very uh, clearly with Raman what is the fundamental vibration, so the fundamental mode of vibration of whatever glass you have. So arsenic selenium, the fundamental mode is somewhere around 220. Arsenic sulfur, it's about 340, and so on. Which if you convert that in wavelengths, uh, that would be for 340, about uh, 30 micron and for 230, 45, 43 micron in wavelengths. However, if we compare our, uh, if we, we compare that to the, uh, the actual optical window that we measure, uh, we're not quite there. We, you know, it's not 30 and 45 micron, it's more like uh, about 12 micron and 20 micron. So the, the issue uh, here is that uh, we actually have overtones and, and so absorption photon that can jump several uh, degree, uh, several uh, uh, vibrational levels. So it's normally not allowed by, by the selection rules, but because the, the actual well is not at all symmetric, it's a very asymmetric well, we have a lot of harmonic unharmonicity, especially with the, the heavy atoms. So uh, these transitions are actually significant. And uh, the, uh, the reason I, I point that out is because we, we have uh, these overtones. And so, for example, uh, if you take two times uh, 340, you have the, the, uh, the, the first overtone of sulfur, which literally cuts off completely the, uh, the absorption. The, the uh, second overtone, so three times 40, generates a significant absorption here. And similarly, for selenium, the, uh, uh, the second overtone, so uh, two times 230, uh, uh, pretty much cuts, cuts off the, the whole transmission, and the uh, 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 second overtone creates that absorption at 14.5. It doesn't seem too bad when you look at, because this is measured through a disc which is only a few millimeters thick, so that doesn't look too bad. However, if you look through a fiber, this is what happens. That little, that overtone that you see here is pretty much 
the source of the cutoff of your fiber. So in only a few meters, you don't see anything left on the other side. So these overtones are, are uh, crucial and, and uh, very limiting uh, for us. So we have to take that into, uh, into account when we, uh, when we design these fibers, or at least if we, uh, uh, we are looking for an optical fiber with a, a specific transmission window. Okay, uh, so again, if you take a, a pure selenium fiber, you will, you'll see that the, uh, the overtone uh, is going to be more intense and, and it will actually cut around 7, 8 microns. And compared to a tellurium rich glass, which it will transmit further down in the infrared. And of course, that is uh, quite crucial if we are looking at signals that are further down, as I, as I mentioned earlier, for example, biomolecules. So the, the, the rich signatures being in the long wavelength range, uh, if you cut at 7, 8, you're, you're pretty much cutting half of, your, uh, half of your signal. So doing PCA, for example, is not going to work so well uh, if, if you're losing half of your, half of your signal. So again, uh, designing these tellurium glasses uh, is quite uh, important to um, uh, for these type of applications. Okay, so uh, that brings me to compositional engineering because tellurium, uh, as it turns out, is not a glass former. It does make chains, but very rigid chains. It does not make these nice chains that entangles. And uh, the reason for that is because it has these very large pi bonds and makes these delocalized uh, pi, uh, extended pi system, uh, which renders it more or less metallic. We have delocalized electrons here, which makes, makes it pretty much a, like a, a rigid, um, rigid chains, or actually it's a helicoidal chains, and, and makes an excellent crystal. So it does not form a glass. You cannot melt tellurium, crunch it in ice water, and come out with a glass. It will be a crystal every single time. Um, so it's impossible to make a bulk pure tellurium glass. So, we need to then play with the, the composition to essentially break up that metallic character. So, so uh, uh, break up these chains, um, break up in terms of, of structure, and, uh, and modify the, these properties. And so one approach to that is uh, the, the classic approach is really to add another element in there um, with a different um, um, coordination. And, and germanium is a, is a good example. You could put arsenic as well. And clearly, we see here that the germanium is, as we know, is tetravalent and therefore generates this tetrahedra. And all these tetrahedra are connected by now very short uh, chains of one or two uh, tellurium atoms and creates then these rings, fairly large rings of, of uh, um, atomic rings, uh, which generates enough flexibility in the structure uh, to allow glass formation, meaning freezing a disordered structure, freezing the structure of the liquid uh, into, a, into the solid state. So we know that's the structure of uh, germanium telluride glass because we've studied it. We've done a combination of neutron diffraction, X-ray diffraction, and XF, so extended X-ray absorption fine structure. Uh, we've uh, fitted all three of them simultaneously with a Monte Carlo uh, simulation. Um, uh, to, to optimize the fitting of all three uh, spectra at the same time, and that's the structure we get. So, so that's the, the, the predicted structure. Now, uh, so if you indeed melt this and quench it in water, you get a glass. It has a delta T of 70 C degree, which is not the best. And what, what do I mean by delta T? Uh, I mean that <coughs> when you melt the glass, or I shouldn't say melt because melt is technically for a crystal, but if I raise the glass above its, its uh, glass transition temperature, uh, so that's, uh, that's a DSC uh, trace here that I'm showing you, so it's a DSC experiment, I'm raising the temperature and at some point the glass gains mobility. It becomes fluid, it enters the, the fluid state. So in that region, my glass, um, it's not a glass anymore, it's a super cool liquid, meaning it's a liquid, but it's actually below its melting point. So it really should be a crystal. It's not thermodynamically, thermodynamically stable. It's metastable. And so as soon as I raise the temperature a little too far that I, gain, I, I uh, give enough mobility to these atoms to rearrange, they will rearrange, but they will rearrange into a crystal because they are still below the melting point. So 
what I'm, uh, so that's my crystallization peak here. It's exothermic because that's a lower energy state. So it's releasing a lot of energy. That's what the DSC is measuring. And that means that I only have a range of temperature delta T. That's what I call the delta T. We call the delta T. Is the range of temperature between the time the glass starts being malleable and the time it crystallizes and you're out of, uh, out of luck because crystals are going to generate very strong scattering loss and your material will be useless for optical applications. So, um, so you only have that range to play with, to mold, to draw, to, uh, to process your, your material. Okay, so <coughs> now delta T here is 70 degrees. So that's very short, actually. That's way too short for fibering, for example. If you try to fiber that material, it will crystallize every time. So, so this is not sufficient for making useful devices out of, uh, out of this glass. So we need to do something more. And essentially, we want to... We want to make sure this structure is even more disordered, or at least that it's not, um, 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 that it, make it more flexible so that it can, it can freeze more easily into a disordered uh, uh, material. And you, so uh, uh, this glass essentially has, uh, is too, co uh, too highly coordinated in some sense that we have small rings that can fairly easily rearrange uh, into, it's a rigid structure that can rearrange easily into a crystal. And so the idea will be to break up that network even more, lower the coordination of the number of bone, really the bone density in that material to make it more uh, likely to, fr to, uh, um, to produce a glass. So the strategy then that we adopt is to substitute uh, germanium or tellurium by an element which has a lower coordination. And you don't find much lower coordination than one, and that would be iodine. Iodine is, uh, 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 and that's why I was talking about the halides, when I was talking about halides uh, earlier. Um, they enter the network very, very well. They make nice covalent bonds with the, the, the germanium in this case. And clearly, uh, what they do is instead of having, you know, a, a, a bridge here between my two germanium, I, I now have uh, two iodines that are terminating and, and therefore opening up the rings a whole lot more and crea creating this uh, uh, more flexible structure, which are uh, much more uh, adamant to creating a disordered glass, a, a freeze into a disordered glass. And we see indeed that the delta T is 124, so it's almost twice as big, just by introducing um, a few percent, a couple percent of um, of, uh, of iodine into the structure. And again, we know that's the structure because we did the same experiment uh, to determine that uh, the iodine will indeed specifically bind to the germanium. It never, uh, for example, it could, you could have a long tellurium chain and an iodine at the end that's uh, terminating the chains, that, that does not happen. So it, it sticks to the, uh, to the, to the germanium. So uh, we investigated a range of composition, and again, with only a few percent of, of iodine within the structure, we can now reach uh, compositions that, are, that have delta T's uh, above 120 degrees, and that's now becoming, uh, you know, it's within the range of, um, of a composition that, uh, of, of, or the range of delta T that is useful to produce fibers, to produce, to, to mold lenses, uh, and so on. So just for comparison, one of the motivations for that work was, uh, again, to, for the, the, the um, Darwin project to capture the, the signal of CO2. And so we, I'm comparing the two compositions, one in, with selenium, one with tellurium, and clearly we see with the telluride tellur glass, we can capture the, um, the, CO2, um, uh, the CO2 signal at 15 micron. So again, to go explore uh, exoplanets. Now I have to be completely honest, uh, there, there is issues with iodine, and uh, there are two issues really. Uh, it's a very volatile material. If you've seen iodine in a lab, it's usually in a jar, and there is a g g purple glow around it because it literally evaporates. Actually, it doesn't evaporate. It goes straight from the solid into the gas. It, it sublimates. So. As I explained, when we make these glasses, we have to do, sub, uh, we have to do um, distillations. We have to pump out the, the material in vacuum to remove the oxygen. And very easily, 
the iodine will also be pumped right out and be trapped in the, in the coal traps and so on. So it's very complicated to actually control the stoichiometry with, with high accuracy because you're always losing some of this iodine. So in practice, it's a very difficult glass to actually produce in high quality, in, in high optical quality. And the second thing, which is even more uh, problematic, is that uh, we found uh, many years after making it that uh, the iodine has a tendency to also just get out of the, the structure. After three or four years, uh, you find out that the, the surface of the glass is, is degrading and, uh, and it's degrading again because the iodine is, is, uh, is coming out. So, so that's an issue and it's definitely, a, 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 you know, for, for production and for real practical application, it's, uh, uh, it's problematic. It was a nice academic work, but uh, you're, you're not going to produce that. So the, the, the alternative that we found uh, is really the same idea. It's just instead of uh, uh, introducing a low uh, coordination element, we substitute germanium by a lower coordination element, and essentially it's substituting arsenic uh, to uh, or germanium to uh, by, by arsenic. Arsenic being trivalent, germanium uh, tetravalent. We reduce the coordination of the network the same way. Uh, same uh, uh, spectroscopic analysis of the structure. We find that we have uh, a lot of germanium arsenic bonds, which was kind of surprising because typically you see uh, tellurium surrounding the, the germanium and the arsenic. But the, the, the result is actually very good. We find that we have um, a wide range of glass forming a, a wide glass forming region, a wide range of composition, which is glass forming. And that means we can make a glass out of any of this composition. And <coughs> the delta T can be very high, up to 145 degrees, which is now plenty enough uh, to, make, uh, to make a fiber. So, so these are the glass then that we decided uh, um, to, uh, to, to work with, to go with, uh, to, uh, to produce optical elements and in particular to produce fibers and th so the, the good thing is they, they retain a good optical transparency and we see that uh, by measuring the transparency again that's measured on disks but we have transparency all the way up to, uh, to 20 microns so uh, these little bumps here are impurities so when we explore a phase diagram we don't bother making an ultra ultra pure material so, because it's too time consuming. So, these were just, you know, uh, remaining oxygen or water, a little absorption. But if we do a good job of purifying the system, we completely get rid of these. Okay, so that brings me to what can we do with this type of uh, material? So once we have a, a good glass, that's the good glass former, uh, of course we can think of making fibers, for example. And in particular, uh, we were asked to make uh, single mode fibers, single mode at 10 microns. So um, as you know, in order to be single mode, your core size has to be in the range of the, the size of the wavelengths, a few times the size of the wavelengths. So that means that we need a really, really small core uh, in, in our fiber. So typically a few tens of microns. Um, so the, the classic way of making a, a, a core clad fiber, so a double index fiber, is to make a rod, drill it, make a smaller rod, insert it in it, and draw the whole thing. Uh, if you are going to need a core which is only a few tens of a micron, uh, that means really that you're going to have to draw twice. Otherwise, you end up with a, a fiber which is so thin that you can barely handle it. So we, we really need to draw it twice, as, as I, I depicted here, uh, in order to end up with the right ratio of size between the core and the, the, the overall fiber. That is a problem because... Uh, even though our delta T is 145 degrees and we have a very stable glass, uh, when you draw once, you again raise your temperature above the glass transition temperature in that metastable domain where the glass really wants to be a crystal. And what happens there is you may create little nuclei, so tiny little crystals that you can barely see that are not even a problem really uh, uh, your light will your your material will still be fairly transparent because the scattering loss will be they are too small to even scatter infrared light however they are there and when you draw a second time 
when you do the second drawing, now you actually grow these, these nuclei. You're in the gross domain. There is a nucleation domain and a gross domain. And that's where the problem starts because now you have crystals which starts having a size which is rough, roughly about the wavelengths and that's where your scattering becomes too important. And so with the pure telluride glass, we tried many times, we always end up with losses that are way higher than the loss that we expect from the actual glass. So, so we could not make these uh, single mode fibers out of a pure telluride glass. We had to, again, uh, engineer the, com the, the structure, engineer the composition, and specifically in that case, add selenium to the mix in order to decrease the tendency for crystallization. And you see only by introducing, this is a pure telluride, in introducing a few percent of selenium already, you see your peak, uh, the, the, the size of your peak, which is really the, the um, tells you is directly proportional to the amount of crystal that you've produced. And you see the, 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 the peak decreasing significantly. And if you introduce a significant amount of selenium, you entirely get rid of the crystallization peak. Now, the, 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 uh, the, the glass is so stable that it doesn't even want to crystallize. So, so that's the composition that we went for, we went with. Uh, in order to do this, this uh, uh, process of double, double drawing. And, and we obtained losses that, are, that were quite reasonable. They are not the losses you obtain with a silicate glass, definitely not. We are talking about a couple dBs per meter, but for, for a single mode uh, fiber at 15 micron, that's, that's the best uh, uh, that has been reported, essentially. So, so we, we get fairly good, um, good losses. Uh, just uh, point out uh, that in order to uh, create the um, uh, index contrast here for between the core and the clad, we only need to substitute one percent of tellurium by selenium. That's sufficient to create that index contrast from 3.02 to 3.01. Uh, so you have to really control your stoichiometry real well in order to produce uh, this kind of uh, this kind of material. Okay, so. Uh, just to show you that they were indeed single mode, uh, we, we produced uh, fiber with different core size. And so with 60 micron, we get four modes. With 50 micron, we get three modes. Uh, 40 micron, we get two modes. And finally, at 30 micron, we get one mode, which it was consistent with the, the refractive index uh, contrast that we used for, that, uh, for, that, uh, for, for these fibers. OK, so. Um, so we, we were pretty happy with that. And uh, uh, again, the motivation here, th there is a number of applications for this type of fiber, uh, the nulling interferometry, but also other type of interferometry. Uh, we did that for DOE. They wouldn't, they wouldn't tell us what they were actually doing with it. But uh, I suppose probably some um, type of, of, a, of a, a sensing, chemical sensing, probably plums of uh, power plants or nuclear plants. Okay, so brings me to another uh, types of another type of uh, application of the of these glasses, and which is uh, fiber evanescent wave spectroscopy. Uh, again, which is essentially uh, detecting all kinds of um, bio biomolecules or chemical molecules uh, using vibrational spectroscopy and by direct contact this time. So. As you know, when light is guided into an ATR or a fiber or, or material, uh, it's trapped inside. However, there is an evanescent wave. Your electric field actually extends above the surface by a micron or a little less than a micron. And so if there is anything in direct contact with the surface, which actually absorbs in that range of wavelengths, uh, then you have an absorption and the light that's coming out is missing your, your, the, 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 the modes that are being absorbed. So, so that's the very same principle as ATR, except in a fiber. And so we do that, and that's what we call the fuse, fiber evanescent wave spectroscopy. And so you, you, the idea here is to bring the light to the sample instead of taking the sample into your spectrometer. So we, we have a light source, and it's a conventional FTIR spectrometer with uh, just a, um, a coupling device into the fiber, and it comes back to an MCT detector, and we can uh, detect a normal, completely normal absorption spectrum. Um, the fiber is tapered in the, the sensing zone. Uh, the purpose, again, is to increase the intensity of the evanescent wave, so make the evanescent wave 
ev extend as far as possible out. And you can see that uh, just by doing that, you increase the detection limit by an order of magnitude or so. Um, and so you can start using these for a number of applications. And in particular in biology, uh, one work we've done with um, Mark Riley, he's not here anymore, but he was in biosystem engineering. Uh, they, they produced uh, cell culture, lung, human lung cells uh, in cultures. And so we coated them at the surface of these fibers, uh, as you can see here. And they, they, they were pretty happy, uh, or actually viable anyway. So the, this is a fluorescent assay just to assess whether they were uh, living or dead. And you see that they are, they are not only are they alive, but they make this nice confluent layer on the surface, uh, which was really good for us. It gives us a, a very good signal. Only a few are dead, and these typically the ones that could not attach to the, to the surface. Um, it may sound surprising because if you remember my composition, I have tons of arsenic in there. And typically, arsenic, you know, uh, you would not l think that a uh, 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 living organism would be too happy with that. However, we've done many tests on these fibers and chemical analysis. Uh, these glasses are extremely stable. They are co arsenic is covalently bonded into that network, and it's very stable in there. Uh, it oxidizes in air at a rate of about a few angstrom every, f uh, what we measured was a few angstrom over five years. Uh, and then you can dissolve that in water. And after that, we grew these fibers, we did tests, uh, inserted a bunch of, uh, uh, of these fibers in, in a, a Petri dish with, uh, while growing these, uh, these cells, and found no toxicity whatsoever. So they are actually currently being almost the same composition being used to uh, develop biosensors in, the, in a company in France. And they also did tests where they, they literally inserted the whole fibers in some mouses and rats. And again, no apparent toxicity. So uh, despite the fact that arsenic definitely is not a, a very good element, it's actually very stable. It's kind of like drinking wine out of a lead glass. It doesn't sound like a good idea plenty of lead in there. You, do want that. you don't want that into your system. However, it's so chemically stable that people drink out of lead glass every day and they are just fine. So similar principle here with arsenic. OK, so uh, what did we do with these? Well, the idea was to monitor their, um, their metabolism, so see how they, how they, they, uh, they, they survive. And so just going back here, uh, this is MI1, MI2. These are the polysaccharides. They are amino acids here. And this little part here is the phospholipid uh, bilayer. So it's the layer of the, the cell. Uh, these are long chains, phospholipid chains that are next to each other that, that creates the, the, uh, the, the layer uh, of the, um, the bilayer of the, of the cell. So we looked at that specifically at that region uh, because we decided to introduce um, some toxicant to disrupt that layer. And essentially, we just introduced a, a surfactant. Triton X100, it's a very effective surfactant. And it basically messes up the interaction between these, these phospholipid molecules and destroys, dissolves, more or less, the, uh, the, the, uh, the bilayer. And we clearly see within a few minutes, within about 20 minutes, the whole bilayer is completely dissolved, the, the cell then uh, dies. So, so in other words, we can use these, uh, this technique to uh, probe in real time the metabolism of a living organism. That's, that's, uh, that, that, that was the, the, the idea here. Another uh, type of biosensing that we did with the similar fibers was uh, probing the migration of uh, a seed of bacteria in a Petri dish. Um, so the, the, the bacteria tend to colonize whatever is around. So that's, that's why if you don't clean up uh, uh, your, your bathroom, you start seeing these uh, layers that uh, develops on the surface. And so they know that uh, the, the phenotype of the what we call the swarmers, the, the bacteria that are at the front of that progressing uh, uh, layer of, of, um, of bacteria are different from the phenotype of the dormant ones, which are inside. And basically, as they grow across the fiber, you see the signal indeed is changing. So we can recognize the swarmers from the dormant ones. Uh, some of them has stronger polysaccharide um, content, and, and the signal uh, was different. 
One other example uh, is now using uh, uh, little mammals, using a mouse, and looking at their, their again, their metabolism, um, and their, in particular, their liver. So, unfortunately for the little mouse here, this is not in situ, this is ex situ, uh, which means its liver was sliced and, uh, and uh, coated on the surface of the fiber. Uh, but uh, the idea was to be able to detect the difference between a mouse that had been uh, uh, starved and a, ma a mouse that had been overfed. And indeed, you see strong differences in the response of the, uh, the liver cells to, um, to that process. And finally, uh, uh, environmental monitoring. So this is chemical uh, monitoring. Uh, in, a, in a real uh, actual water well uh, in Europe where they, they did this test. So this is the end of the spectrometer that you see here. And these two little tubes here are the, the fiber ferrules. And so the, the fiber actually comes out here and enters the well. And so what they did is they, they, on the other side of the well, they, they, they uh, introduced very small amount on a few ppms of uh, tetrachloroethylene, which is a really nasty pollutant which has been involved in many contamination and cancers and leukemia and all kinds of things. Uh, and they, they indeed were able to uh, detect, this is the main peak of tetrachloroethylene, they, they were able to detect the spike uh, as the, as the, in real time as the, um, the tetrachloroethylene makes it through the, the water well and with, again, only a, a few ppm uh, resolution. And so I hope I convinced you that these materials are interesting, and in particular for optics. Uh, I just want to thank our, our support here, the International Associated Lab, which is the, the people in France that I work uh, with a lot, the CNRS, uh, the Partner Uni University Fund. And I'll be glad to answer any question if you have any. Any question? Nasser. No,